Hi guys, Quentin here. I'm sat with Matt Allen from uh, Pivot Power, or part of EDF Renewables. And we are, well, it's the, the morning after the uh, Modo after party from the Energy Storage Summit. So our voices probably sound a bit leathery. And we're gonna talk about all things Pivot Power, big batteries, and what's coming next. So Matt, thanks for coming on. And uh, this is gonna be a lot of fun. So Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks um, for having me. And you've just come, come off a panel downstairs. Um, anything controversial on the panel? It was a good conversation. I mean, I think there are a lot of questions around investor appetite, level of comfort, what revenue streams are looking like, you know, the actuals we're seeing together or seeing today, which is great, but are those gonna be sustainable for the future? Um, a lot of things around CapEx increases and all that other fun stuff. Everything's going up. And then of course, uh, morning this morning on the news, um, Ukraine and Russia is all uh, sort of kicking off, which is going to make things interesting. Yeah. So um, we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about uplifting stuff. So um, what's Pivot Power? Who's Matt Allen? Let's do Matt Allen first, and then we're going to do Pivot Power, and then we're going to talk about what you guys are doing in the world. So who's Matt Allen? Who Man, who is Matt Allen? That's a deep question. Um, <laughs> yeah. Still trying to figure himself out. Oh. Um, born and raised in a small little beach town in Northern California. Um, all that really mattered me in life was throwing a ball, um, which I'm still going to make a comeback at the age of 43 and be a starting pitcher for the San Francisco Giants. Um, so that's the next phase. But um, yeah, I played baseball through university and then my arm gave out. And then I went outside the US and I decided, hey, it makes sense to go into the US Peace Corps and did development work in Southeast Asia on the board, uh, border of Cambodia and Thailand. For three years, came back, worked on the losing end of the John Kerry campaign. Oh and, man! <laughs> um, so what was that? Uh, this is, we've got we've got to dig into that. What was that like? It was. Did you know you were going to lose? Interesting. Halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I say worked on the campaign, the reality was we were ripping out as much money from the state of California so we could go buy Ohio and Florida because that's the democratic process yeah. in the United States of America. <laughs> yeah. um, so working on the campaign is a bit uh, loose. And um, we then yeah, took all this money and rent all these vans and uh, shoved old people into the vans to make sure that they would go vote. Of course, we'd ask them who are they going to vote for before we shoved them in the vans. Um, but anyway, so yeah, democracy, fantastic. I don't have a better solution, though, so I'm not going to complain about that. Um, but yeah, so, um, so uh, John Kerry in the States. And yeah. then, then what? When did you go over, come over here? And then about 15 years ago, came over here um, to do an MBA in public policy in the University of Birmingham. I uh, did it there because uh, they, I didn't have to take a standardized test, um, which I would have horrifically failed. With GMAT. Um, yeah, oh. yeah, no. So Also, sh um, shout out to Birmingham as well. I didn't realize you were at Birmingham University. Yeah. Osmodo is, is Birmingham's um, um, hottest company. No. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's our home, so... Well, I mean, with the accent, you can obviously tell I'm Brummy first and foremost, um, born and raised. But um, yeah, after I decided to stay in the UK purely because the exchange rate was 2.1 and I could uh, try to pay off my student loans as fast as possible. And 15 years later, I have uh, an eight-year-old and a six-year-old that asked me in the morning, Daddy, can I have some water? Which is very strange when your kids don't sound like you. Um, Did you have to do the citizenship test? The the, the, the test we have to learn about uh, 1066 and all these old things that even English people don't know. I did, yeah, and I passed it. I right. can't tell you one question that was on it. But I'm now <laughs> as British as you. Well, yeah, welcome, welcome. Yeah. And, as, <laughs> and as brummy as you, too. Yeah, uh, I should do, do a brummy accent for that. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. And then um, we haven't talked about energy yet. What, so when did you get into energy? Yeah, so... Or when um, did you get into energy? <laughs> yeah. So I joined this very odd company that you know a bit about. Um, I wasn't really sure. Uh, very eccentric um, CEO, uh, this guy Michael Liebreich. Mm -hmm. And um, about a year before, this company New Energy Finance, before they were acquired by Bloomberg. And that was a pivotal <laughs> moment you know, for me. In <laughs> terms gong of this. For yeah, that. yeah. yeah. Um, it, this is an industry that I'm pumped about. Um, I want to be a part of this. And it kind of gave me exposure to kind of a little bit of everything and um, helped me understand a little bit about all the disparate components and market economics and policy and supply chain and how it all comes together. And I was there for almost uh, five years and um, headed up the global commercial sales team. And uh, Bloomberg and EF. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then um, I left. I joined um, Good Energy um, as commercial director there. Um, only lasted about a year. 
but uh, then went on and worked for, ran a small renewables developer before the feed-in tariff was cut and then laid everybody off and laid myself off. And then I joined uh, Tempest Energy, yeah. um, where I met. Shout out to Tempest for all of the capacity market stuff. And we'll just, I mean, what a, what a history of a company. Have you? <laughs> Absolutely. And he says with humility, um, you know, Sarah was great at recruiting amazing talent. And I met this guy, Michael Lawrence Clark, um, my co-founder and brother. And as we were leaving, I said, how about you work? We're having a beer and he explained it to me. And I actually understood it. I didn't really, but I was like, wow, there's something to be said for being able to explain complex thing, a complex thing in a way that you can understand. So, uh, just need to, um, for anyone who's listening that yes, there's a lot of sirens behind us, but I think it's okay. Is the producer says it's okay. We're okay. Sorry. It's nothing we did. No, it's no, no, yeah. they're not getting louder. That's yeah. a big point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I told Mikey famously that, uh, I could pimp you out which is a very strange thing to say somebody when you want to start a company with them. But I think the big thing was, um, and there was a real chemistry between the two of us. And we started meeting with- Your Mikey. Yeah. yeah. And um, we both were very comfortable with our strengths and also our shortcomings. And, um, and we looked at, mainly the focus was behind the meter and our first project. And uh, about nine months later, we met, met our third brother, um, Matthew Bolton. and. Matt Allen and Mikey Clark, MA and MC, um, met this guy, MB. And about 10 minutes in, I said, are you up for this? Matthew's like, what? And Mikey said, should we talk about this? I said, no. You know, A and C can only get so far. We need A, B, C, M, A, M, B, M, C. So are we going to do this? And he's like, is this how you make decisions? Yeah, kind of. The gods are telling us something. Um, and, and. Yeah, jokingly, but there was such, you know, and there still is to this day, you know, the three of us, but it was everybody that came into the journey with us. We're just very, very comfortable. And we're comfortable at the front. We're making this up as we go. We don't know how to do this. So there's um, three of you um, that started Pivot Power, is that right? And, yeah. Um, and Pivot Power, when did, it, when did Pivot Power begin? Of course, it was an idea and he talked about it in the pub and things, but... 43 years ago. <laughs> um, no. Uh, it's a combination of your life's, <laughs> life's work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brought that question full circle. Um, it... Th- we were focusing on the behind the meter stuff and then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, floor fell out of the frequency response market and put those numbers into the models. Like, oh, wow, negative returns. Who wants those for Christmas? Because you guys did the, um, you did the Arsenal battery, right? The yeah. Tesla system, one of the biggest Tesla systems at the time, um, behind the meter, Arsenal. Um, it's a big project. It was. It was three years, literally, from the day that I met Mike Lloyd, the stadium manager I caught up with a couple months ago for dinner, at a conference to us cutting a ribbon at this beautiful three megawatt battery. I had my kids there at the time. I was crying my eyes out and it was it was pretty cool it was pretty special but man it was complicated do you get <laughs> tickets do you get free tickets now we do we go yeah um we haven't been for a while i'm not even a f- huge football fan um ironically but it was so cool to 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 make it happen and there was a real validation of like we did it you know we hadn't closed a deal we hadn't closed a door you know but we got a project across the line it wasn't easy you know putting a multi-million pound system off balance sheet that's kind of flammable and has some risks in a 400 million pound stadium. Um, yeah, lawyers had a field day with that one. Yeah, I bet. But, but we got it across the line and right around that time, we we're kind of like, man, this is not really scalable. Um, and we were thinking that, well, there's a lot of spare capacity at the transmission system and what the DNOs are constrained. And how are we going to electrify transport when there isn't really much juice laying around at that level? And and it all really just kicked off with a conversation with a few incredible people at National Grid. Um, and it was this kind of right place, right time. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of luck that goes into all of this stuff. But, um, you know, we all of a sudden just started running, running, running and downing invested in starting this new company. So to answer your question, Pivot Power, so the acquisition was about two and a half years ago. And um, we had the EDF acquisition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so Pivot has been incorporated for about four years now. Okay, um, so you yeah. started four years ago and um, we, we touched on it there for a second, but what was the vision when you started this thing? Is it, is it about building big? Is it about building fast? Is it about, about building with transport in mind? 
Um, what, what, what are you aiming for? I don't know who came up with this phrase. It doesn't really matter. Um, a distributed, a distributed, distributed lithium ion to Norwig. And I thought that Ooh, was that's good. brilliant. That's very good. I thought that was brilliant. It's like two gigawatts of batteries dotted all around the country that National Grid in the control room could play the piano, turn this, um, turn this down. It doesn't have the duration of, of large pumped hydro, but it had the same characteristics and some better characteristics, you know, the distributed nature of it and so on. And so it was this kind of like you get to volume, you get to scale, and then that gets really, really interesting in the control room, potentially. We don't know. We're not even at that that scale yet. But I think that's where this stuff will get really interesting. Is once we get to you know volume, um, how can you really use a central well a decentralized asset of large um, disparate components to to really balance the system and allow more renewables to come on the system? So that was the battery co, and then the wire co, which as far as I'm concerned. We take a big wire and we throw it over the fence at the National Grid substation. We run it to a location. That location could be a bus depot. It could be a corporate fleet. It could be a Tesla supercharger. It could be any place. And because um, one of the biggest issues is not can we buy an electric vehicle? Can we buy chargers? Um, sure. There's just not enough capacity to charge these things. Yeah. So um, that is the big piece that we're looking to address on the, the kind of private wire component. So you guys, for people who don't know Pivot, you guys build big batteries, right? And other stuff, but um, as you mentioned, but um, really your core is building a big portfolio of sites that you've got, that you're gonna work your way through. In fact, you've already built a couple, or you've, what have you already built? So yeah, far? so our first two, um, first one in Oxford, uh, the Cali substation, which is part of the Energy Super Hub Oxford, ESO, which becomes very confusing because oh. not the ESO. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the second one uh, is in Kemsley in Sittingbourne, Kent. And mm -hmm. those are now operational online. Um, so lithium, lithium ion batteries built by? Lithium. We have uh, Vatsila um, and Samsung cells for cool. those first two. Um, we also have, as part of an Innovate UK project, um, an Infinity Flow system. Uh, okay. It's coming online very shortly. And then the private wire component um, in Oxford is we have four megawatts going live uh, early April. So two going to Tesla, two to Fastnet um, for uh, one of the UK's largest uh, charging hubs at a Red Bridge park and ride um, in Oxford. And also looking at uh, bus opportunities very quickly around the corner in Oxford. Um, so this kind of private wire piece in Oxford coming together. We have broken ground and are currently building our next two systems. Um, now those first two were one hour duration. Uh, our next two in Coventry and uh, uh, Bustleholme, Northwest Birmingham, we've pivoted. That's the second one. Ding. A dong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I've moved to two hour duration, um, which was sooner than I think we expected. Um, but it does make sense and we're seeing more kind of two hour, not long duration storage, but yeah. longer. And so those, we've broken ground there. Those again are 50 megawatt systems. Um, and then many others to come. I mean, that's the big, big just, focus for us. I remember when you guys, when the acquisition happened, because it was big, right? This, I mean, of course, everyone talks about building lots of massive pipelines and big assets now, but two and a half years ago, it was kind of novel what you guys were doing, but well, it was novel. And at the time, I think in, it was like this, like, gigawatts and gigawatts of, of pipeline that you've got um, to build. And what, what are the numbers? What are you planning to build? And is it EDF who's gonna, is EDF who's gonna um, finance these? Yeah. The funny thing is we didn't even have a website. And we got a website and it was, I think a week before this press release went out because we got a call from National Grid that they told us that Pivot Power after four or five months being incorporated that we were the largest connection holder by sites in the entire country. I think EDF was number two, Centrica, Orsted, and of course, Pivot Power. <laughs> we had 45, 46 at the time, um, which was kind of like, oh my God, what is going on right now? This is, and we had a press release that went out and it said two gigawatts battery storage to be deployed, uh, requiring 1.6 billion pounds um, for the private wire and the, the battery component. I don't even know how many zeros are in a billion. Um, and and we got a lot of attention for five minutes and it was, it was kind of cool and kind of annoying. And it was like, we get back to doing stuff. And I don't regret 
I remember when I saw it, it was like, man, these Bragawatt developers. Yeah. That's what we've become. Bragawatt guys. Like, look at, look at them. Big numbers. We didn't have 1.6 billion pounds. We had enough to pay our rent and our payroll for the next couple of months. But I'm glad that we did it because that's the language we should be talking about. If we're not talking about gigawatts and billions, we're having the wrong conversations. Yeah, yeah. And going too slow. Um, this is a transition. You know, this is a crisis. We need to be talking about big numbers. And if this is infrastructure, those are the kind of kind of, kind of numbers. Um, and so, anyway. But going back to your, your question, when we went out to raise uh, the first 250 million. Um, the request was to have that go into the, the kind of top co of the company to fund our first assets and then build more and build more and whatever that looks Sport, like. Before EDF Renewables before EDF. bought you, right? Yeah. Yep. And so um, EDF Renewables um, filled out the term sheet wrong and uh, they uh, suggested an acquisition of us, um, which was, you know, at the time, it was like, is this the right? That's not what we were trying to do. Um, it wasn't about remaining independent. I mean, if you somebody puts two hundred million in, you, we would have owned a sliver of it. But it, it was the right thing. I'm not saying that to win hearts and minds of you know EDF EDF renewables renewables, but it was the right place for it to be. Um, three months, four months after the acquisition, this COVID thing hit. A company cares about its people, and that means a lot. They are nice. That means a lot. <laughs> Um, and you know, these are people, friends, family that I care a lot about. And it's been amazing to see people's careers, you know, develop and, you know, a large organization and opportunities and so on. And, and yeah, I mean, when you lay on your deathbed, I'll think about many other things. I'm not going to think about how many batteries we built. I mean, think about, you know, did, did we allow people to do amazing things? Did we believe in them? Did we back them? Um, did we help support and build their careers? And so I think, you know, on that basis, it was the right, right place to be. I think we're in a super, super exciting place right now. Just coming back to this. Yeah. So, so you went out to market to raise 250 million pounds. It's a big number. So yeah, of course, as you say, at, when you're raising that kind of money, you, you lose your independence <laughs> anyway. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So what's the, so, what's but, the difference? Yeah. Um, so that's a big, that's a big number, right? So um, we went out to raise the money. I assume, I assume back then you pitched a... Um, everybody's the big banks and, and whatnot. Um, what was that experience like back then? Because this was numbers that people hadn't really talked about and you were going big and you were saying, I want it now. Yeah. So how was that? It was slightly surreal. And this is what, 2017, 2018? No, this was later 20, uh, our first investor meeting was uh, in January, 2019. Okay, right. And we met with around 40 institutional funds, infrastructure funds, corporate strategics. Morgan Stanley was representing us and you know, meetings with everybody. Everybody loved it. First meeting, second meeting. You know, stuff that sits at the foundation, the energy transition, big batteries, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. They all loved it. Um, but the big M word came out, merchant. Oh, there's... Merchant. <laughs> merchant. And in one meeting, I was told by Morgan Stanley, don't ever say that again. That sounds disrespectful and condescending. And maybe it was meant to. But I was like, what is Where it, merchant? Where did the word merchant come I from? I mean, yeah. this is so silly. Everybody says it like they know what it is. Like, okay, we can describe it. Blah, blah, blah. It's about trading and it's about wholesale marketing. But really, where does it come from? I've I, never heard of it before, this this yeah. silly industry that we're in. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, what isn't merchant? You buy yeah, a house exactly. that's merchant. You <laughs> built this hotel that was merchant. You built a pub. What do you think if, you know, you only sold 70 pints that night, the government was going to buy 30 pints, you know, for you to top up, you know, your your missed pint sales if it was a pub? Um, the barter system was merchant. I, we're probably going to have someone uh, write in or comment and say, we're an economic source that says that it's merchant. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, look, I understand it. I mean, especially, you, you know, you have fiduciary responsibilities, you know, pension funds and so on to protect investments and, you know, different things have different risk profiles and so on. <clears throat> I, mean, I think one of the personal benefits I have, I don't come, I don't have an investment background, I don't have a legal background, I don't have an engineering background, I don't, I don't know. So I just understand a little bit of all the disparate parts. But um, I think what it comes down to is you can sub grab every single chart and kind of support the narrative. But do you think that more renewables are going to be built in the future? Yes. Well, we've come in net zero and so on. Do you think that electric vehicles are going to be rolled out? faster than we ever expected. Yes. Okay. So would you like to invest? And it doesn't, I mean, it gets more complicated than that, I guess, but you do have to believe. 
a bit of conviction. The rest of the stuff will kind of come together. Um, but some of these things have become fundamental truths. And I don't know anybody that disagrees, you know, the pace and the other. Um, Just the Excel sheet is too complicated to put together. Yeah. That's the thing that holds it up, isn't it? Yeah, I think Mikey disconnected uninstalled excel on my laptop pretty early on because i would just yell at these things how do the models work um <laughs> so but uh so these guys so you were pitching to them and in, in january 2019 and they were really excited and then you said but you told them you know you're going to trade with these batteries and it's not going to be guaranteed revenue streams they're used to cfds and all that stuff and then what they, they did they get cold feet or um no we did we had um we had advancing other conversations with with funders but there was still a lot of concern mm -hmm. um and when edf put forward i would love to say that we had 40 offers on the table we didn't we absolutely didn't um there were people that really really wanted to but they realized their investment committees you know wasn't gonna be able to go through so um so i you know it was october 31st 2019 4 36 p.m um i definitely didn't think it was going to happen even at that point, it was kind of done for a couple of weeks and you're waiting for final things to see it signed. And it was it was a pretty cool moment. Um, All right, congratulations. Yeah, it was, it was the, the coolest thing was going home. We had a glass of champagne and, everybody went out, and I went home and I picked up my kids and we went trick-or-treating. <laughs> and I floated. Like I floated. But I floated because I was able to be with them again. You yeah. know? And for the first couple of years of life, I didn't. I yeah. wasn't. I wasn't there. And... But it was also the thing, it was like, holy shit, this very average at best, like barely graduated from anything, doesn't understand, could pull this off. And, you know, so when it comes to kids, when it comes to, you know, company, it's like to be able to realize that, like everybody wants to say, you can do anything, you can do anything. My son, a couple years ago, he was going to be an astronaut. And I think when he was six, he came home and he said, ah, daddy, I'm not going to be an astronaut. Why? And you realize the numbers are only like 20 people that were astronauts. And it was like, wow, we do get to that point at some point when we tell ourselves that we can't be an astronaut. And that kind of sucks. So we should all be astronauts. But, you know, I, it is one of those things that um, there are many, many attributes and characteristics about America that grind me. But one of the things I do love is we're too dumb and naive to think we can't pull stuff off. Yeah, there's a, there's a, if it's not me, then who else? Right? Yeah. Attitude, which, yeah. Is, which is incredible. So you, um, so then EDF Renewables came in, uh, injected capital into the company, and you started building these assets. And so um, I've got to ask you the question, but you know what's coming, Matt, because I asked you before. So if you've got all these sites and you've got EDF backing you, um, and um, there's such an opportunity, we agree, we're in a space, we like, speed, 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 right? If you're building assets, if you can get assets built right now, and you've got backers, and you've got sites, and you've got connections, and it kind of makes sense, then why wait? Yeah. So my question to you is, why wait? Is pivot power waiting? Or is it just a natural cycle of how you have to do it? You have to do one project at a time, mm. it just takes time, and blah, blah, blah. That's not a direct, uh, no. I'm not, not saying anything bad about pivot power here, I'm just... I'm questioning if you've got two gigawatts, why not do them all at once? This podcast is done. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's absolutely a fair question. I have no problem with that question. Um, and it's not be There is, uh, what is it, cautiously optimistic. And that's not just CDF. There's a lot of money that has been raised that is desperately looking for projects. Uh -huh. um, and there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of activity um, that's taking place. Now, within two years, and we had... Um, for our next two projects, which um, will hopefully be closing internally, you know, that will take the kind of investment made over 120, 130 million, um, you know, in two years, you know, mm -hmm. for media renewals. That's, that's, could it be more? Sure. Should it be more? Maybe. But there is a demonstration of a commitment to build. It could be faster, but there are pieces to the whole chain. One of them, connection dates, you know, with National Grid and lining those up. If we turn around and are going to say, hey, we want to do 20 projects, 50 mega gigawatt tomorrow, um, that wouldn't be able to happen. Uh, those connection dates, those are lined up and um, at different stages. So we're kind of reliant on that kind of interface. The supply chain, needless to say, is is a bit of a challenge, um, whether it comes, you know, capex and costs um, and ability to deliver, you know, timings and so on. So there, there are a lot of other factors that if you had the ambition and the commitment and the financial bank like run 
mm-hmm. there would still be kind of a phasing you know, to it. So I guess a long-winded answer to say um, I am optimistic that we will accelerate, that we will um, be building at volume, you know, this kind of two per year build out, um, that that starts to, to ramp up a bit. You know, you would say, look, the actuals, the outturns, real financial numbers, they're amazing right mm. now. It's a no brainer. But then, you know, you look at it's like, well, is that going to be the case for the next 20 years? No. It feels a bit like we're in Las Vegas right now. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. You know, next year it may not be a great year for batteries. I hope it's not. Obviously, um, I don't think it will be. But there is a lot of volatility inside of volatility. Volatility. We rely on volatility <laughs> yeah. in terms of... There's probably like, a mathematical equation yeah. in there somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. Two negatives no, no, make no. a positive? Um, yeah, not the volatility is a negative VIX or something I don't know <laughs> yeah so um, you guys you're, two, you're doing roughly two, two um, a year it's like 100 megawatts 200 megawatts something like that that's the plan we, we moved to um, well yeah 100 megawatts 200 megawatt hours um, mm-hmm. which we're building right now um, and then looking at the same you know this we have more projects that we're advancing um, through the pipeline and also a very very interesting trend not just for us but for others is is looking at um co-location hybrid um uh, with a lot of our connections okay. so looking at solar plus storage and so we have a couple um sites back end of this year that will be going to investment committee and kind of that model is being finalized but that seems to be a big trend whether it's retrofitting of existing generation with storage or kind of new build um generation plus storage mainly solar uh, solar plus storage. It's, funny, it's, it's, it's a different model, isn't it? Because you've, um, there's two ways to think about it. Is you either you've got a big battery and you're going to put well, the way that I feel we talk about it as an industry in co-location is um, we've got a solar solar farm and we're going to put a battery on it to smooth the solar farm and dispatch it later in the day or whatever. Yeah. In my head, and having thought about it and speak, speaking to colleagues, I, I feel like it should be the other way around, which is we've got a big battery and we're going to use solar to charge the battery cheaply hmm. rather than we've got a big solar park we're going to use storage to solve the solar problem it's kind of the other way around you, yeah. you basically your solve electricity supply chain to your battery is being de- is de-risked and to zero well, obviously the cost of capital blah 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 blah, boring stuff but you get the idea yeah. right i just wonder uh, how, how are you thinking about the hybrid co-location model the way that you described it and i i would love to build it you know an online simulation, I gamify this whole thing. But if you think of SimCity and you were to build a city and then you have to build the energy infrastructure stuff, you would dot a bunch of batteries all around the city, all different corners and, and so on. And then you'd start putting some generation to charge up those batteries. And then you get this kind of virtuous circle of how that all comes together. So I, I agree with, um, with your approach. I guess it, Really, a lot of it comes down to some of the regional aspects of, um, you know, SUAS, DUAS, different charges in, in where that network, that node is, um, but also kind of wholesale prices during those those periods. And then, you know, some of the products and services ancillary or other that you can do with the battery. So it may pivot over time. Number three. Dung. Oh, is it ding? Is it dung? I don't know why I'm saying ding, dong. Dung. It's a ding, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> uh, it was a late night. <laughs> it was a late um, night. But, but yeah, but I, I think that it can... I mean, it's funny that when we came up with the name Pivot, it was Matthew and I, not you, Mikey. Um, and we're like, Burn. oh my God, p- Pivot, Pivot Power. Originally, it was going to be Paradigm Power. Like, oh my God, that's terrible. And Pivot Power is like, wow, there's no way that's available. And we went to a company's house and it was... But it's like, man, what better? It was just hilarious because we were pivoting away from behind the meter storage into big utility scale stuff. But that does kind of describe our industry, battery storage, and even the generation stuff. It, you know, we could have called it floor power, predictable <laughs> revenue power, <laughs> government yeah. subsidy yeah. backed power. <laughs> but it's pivot positive power. NPV power. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh, so um, I want to get, get a couple more questions in because we, uh, I know you have a lot of opinions on in general, on everything. So um, what's going on? Okay, two things. What do you love that's going on at the moment? Big change in the energy industry that's going on, particularly in our world. And then what really pisses you off? <laughs> Let's do the love first, though, and then we can we can double down on the... 
we're gonna we're gonna edit yeah. this long yeah. pause. Yeah. No, I, this, I'm just gonna fill it. this well, long pause. I with... think part of what well, part of the the issue is that you know, we surround ourselves in echo chambers of you know from a, obviously from a work perspective and from a actually most of my friends I work with. Maybe I should get some friends if I don't want to. <laughs> that um, feeling when you're like, I, I, I'm only 31. But I've, I've been told there's a point in, in your 30s where you look around and you're like, I don't actually have any friends. It's just people I work with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but so I, I think, and the reason I was pausing is because it's like everybody's optimistic that this is happening. And it, it, there's a different feeling of optimism and, and that this is, um, that we can do this and this tra- transition is going to happen and so on. Um, but I don't know if that's just the people that I work with that are in this industry, because the rest of the general public, which actually is the second part to your question, um, is this is a climate crisis. And, and this needs to be a participatory sport that everybody is on the pitch involved in playing. And we can't have people on the sideline and it can't be us talking about, you know, and so it serves as squiggly lines and complicated stuff. It needs to be understood by the masses. The reason I loved that Arsenal project and where I feel like the heart of of it came from was the first meeting that I had was I pitched an idea to to this guy at Arsenal, which was about putting solar on the roof or battery in the basement, but said you could either fund it yourself or we could get, you know, private equity firm to fund it. But there's a third option. He said, what's that? I said, we get the fans to own and operate it. Or not operate it, to own it um, and be a part of the direction of travel, of energy independence and sustainability and so on. He's like, that's cool. Let's do that. I was like, oh, shit. I don't, uh, was this a crowdfunding platform? I didn't know what I was doing. But he loved that. And I loved that he loved that. And it kind of snowballed into it. Um, you know, Downing, who funded it, there was the Downing crowd. So it was a realistic concept and we could refinance it through as a bond. But, um, but we pivoted or uh, ding dong, <laughs> ding dong. Both there. And but what I loved about that was the opportunity to bring people on the journey. And if you can have a father son or you know, assuming a football match, have a conversation and they're under the jumbotron, a big, you know, iPad screen of a battery and showing, you know, how it was filled up, you know, pre-match time and how it's being dispatched and. You know, if that that child had a hundred pound bond that was given to, you know, by a grandparent, whatever, like that becomes really, really, really exciting. And right now, this whole transition, it's like us, you know, the people working in this industry, but the rest of the people are kind of, hey, industry, I hope you pull it off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Um, too complicated because there's too many complicated words and there's things like, I don't know, the whole, our whole energy industry is crazy complicated and in many cases i don't have this to serve itself in being more complicated absolutely um, and we need to be able to communicate it to everybody our relationship Maybe. with it is very basic i mean we walk up to the wall and we press a button it goes on uh, it's very predictable um we don't have to deal with outages much knock on wood um but you know it like not saying it has to be deeper it's not the most interesting exciting concept but you know that's one of the only links commonalities that Arsenal has with its fans, electricity. So, you know, how can you use those things to create those connections, that understanding and that awareness? And, and you know, people, I'm not delusional. People go to inter, be entertained and see guys run around and kick a ball. But if that conversation can happen for 10 seconds about, huh, that's interesting. There's a battery in the basement. It's filled up with wind and salt and it's used during the match. Huh, okay, cool. Oh, and it, that's how it makes money. It fills up during cheap times and pushes out during expensive times. It's a big sponge. It fills up with cheap water and pushes out expensive water. That's actually really all I understand. <laughs> Other people explain it to me. I think, but, yeah. but it, it creates a level of intuition, um, which you, you don't need the complicated long paragraphs to explain it. It's an intuition thing. It's a sort of, um, it's pub chat. Yeah. Right? It needs to be pub chat to, to, to really get the hearts and minds of these people. Pitch it um, to a parent. You know, that's my my mom when I was explaining to her what her crazy delusional son was doing. I mean, she said, so yeah, the wind doesn't always blow. The sun doesn't always shine. So we need batteries. Like, And I've told that story a hundred times because, yeah, that's basically yeah, yeah. like, it, it, it's not wildly more complicated than that. Um, it's pretty basic in its concept, but not that's why we need this stuff. Either. Oh, my God. Oh, you know, when the sun goes away, <laughs> that's when we do this thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we go into our first, yeah, site. 
it was double stacked 40 foot shipping containers where it's like, wow, it's beautiful. What's going on, Mikey, Adrian? How does this work? <laughs> um, but it's not a big you know, wind turbine and 50 acres of solar. It's you know, a bunch of boxes in a field. The, contain- the containers thing's funny. Like, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's become normal and we think about it as a normal thing. But I mean, it didn't have to be this way. Uh, and the, uh, I don't know, if you asked me 10 years ago, what's a grid scale battery going to, well, I probably wouldn't even be able to describe it. But I wouldn't have said it comes in a load of shipping containers and you stick them in a field. Yeah. But uh, hey-ho, that's the world we live in now. Yeah. Um, last question, Matt, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. Anything you want to get off your chest? This is not a confession, mm. by the way. This is not, um, but um, is there anything that you want to raise? Um, you can you can actually file a formal complaint with Modo right now if you want. No, uh, is there anything that um, you think we need to discuss or talk about more, um, or something that you've been pondering? The answer no is also okay. <laughs> I don't know if this is an age thing or being a parent thing, or a deep level of um, imposter syndrome, maybe a combination of all of them. But like, maybe I'm not trying to lecture, but like play to your strengths and be proud of those things. And like own the shit out of your weaknesses, your shortcomings, things you haven't done, probably never will do. And I just, it's funny because I think that with, Mikey, Matthew, and myself, and then everybody came into it. Like, we never talked about it. We never wrote down, this is what I'm good at, and this is what I'm not good at. And then you try to, but like, in building a company, I think that that's like an ingredient that's just so important. And I think if we all did that from a society standpoint, you know, just think how much better we would be. Like, I'm good at some things, and I'm not good at many things. And that's okay. I look at, I actually kind of did this at the start, and I, things I'm good at. And I had like four or five things. I was like, Decent chat, kind of confident, you know, American accent. Worked in this industry for 10 years, so I know a lot of people. I haven't screwed people over, so maybe I could activate my network, whatever that means. And then I had four sheets of things that I wasn't good at. I was like, oh, wow. Let's do it, Matt. Let's go to that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But in meeting Mikey, and I went back and looked at it, and then Matthew and everybody else. And, you know, now I'm perfect. I am absolutely perfect. (laughs) I Please think, don't don't cut that out as we, just I am perfect. But that you, would be the soundbite yeah. on LinkedIn. We yeah. need to do this at Modo. We should probably get everyone to. Um, just, we should just we should just cry <laughs> and write down all the things we're not happy about ourselves. And the, maybe we we'll just get it all out. Yeah, yeah. The team has seen me cry far too many times. <laughs> um, but I think that yeah, you know, let's be honest. Let's be vulnerable. Let's you know all these things that I think that, um, and I've really enjoyed. You know, if you met me five years ago, very different. Um, I think, you know, Pivot allowed me to, it accepted me for everything. And in return, you know, we, them, and it was, it, it was just really cool to see this kind of acceptance. Like we celebrated mistakes. We pick each other up and say, awesome. I used to have people come up with ideas. I forgot to sign a grid connection or something like that. And he was super worried. We had an intern and she sends Outlook invites to make with somebody else grab a whiteboard and write down all the dates and i was sitting there like wow that's they they didn't want mikey to mess up again and it was like we have your back buddy and it was so cool to just see there's been so many other times where i've just been sitting there like watching i love when things go wrong because people put on their Superman, Superwoman capes, and they and I'm like, Jesus, look at this! Can I get you a coffee or anything? You get the good, the good out of everybody turns up. Yeah, and it's and it's just it's so powerful and special to be a part of. You know, I we were either the best equipped or worst equipped for lockdown. You know, I just loved being in that environment with those those people every day. Where I used to try to get there early to make the coffee. That was just I loved doing that and telling me, but it was just to try to. You know, be there to support people and give them high fives and tell them we can do this. And um, so anyway, that wasn't getting something off my chest. I didn't want to get that. Well, anyway, maybe because, you know, I, I feel early stage startup companies, you, you really and it does start with the person who's running the show. 
you're a very talented guy, I have no doubt, but I'm pretty sure you have some shortcomings, and I hope that your colleagues know that. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, my, they, I think we have a pretty firm understanding of uh, many of those. Good, <laughs> yeah. good. All right, cool. Um, Matt, I just want to say thanks for coming on. Um, I know you've got loads of people to, to, to meet today, and, and, and finding time to do this is, is very generous of you, so thank you. I'm just going to fall asleep on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, someone does actually stay on the sofa last night. That's a long story. Um, and we are going to... We, well, we'll be keeping our own uh, Pivot Power. I guess uh, if people want to know more about Pivot Power, we'll put their website in the website in the comments. Let us know uh, if you're watching this, what you think. If you've got any more questions, I'm sure we can pass them on. And see you in the next episode. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much.